including my fellow Americans. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Change of the political party in charge has not made a difference who's really in charge. Someone is responsible, and it's important for those of us who love liberty and resent big brother government, identify the philosophic supporters who have the most to say about the direction our country is going. These are the neoconservatives of recent fame. Granted, they are talented and achieved a political victory that all policymakers must admire. But can freedom and the republic survive this takeover? That question should concern us. Neoconservatives are obviously in positions of influence and are well placed throughout our government and the media. The neoconservatives, a name they gave themselves, diligently worked their way into positions of power and influence. Above all else, they were not and are not conservatives dedicated to limited constitutional government. More recently, the modern-day neocons have come from the far left, a group historically identified as former Trotskyites. Liberal Christopher Hitchens has just recently joined the neocons, and it has been reported that he has already been to the White House as an ad hoc consultant. Many neocons now in position of influence in Washington can trace their status back to Professor Leo Strauss of the University of Chicago. Paul Wolfowitz actually got his PhD under Strauss. Others closely associated with these views are Richard Pearl, Elliot Abrams, Robert Kagan, William Crystal. All are key players in designing our new strategy of preemptive war. Others include Michael Ledeen of the American Enterprise Institute, former CIA Director James Woolsey, Bill Bennett, Frank Gaffney, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld. The godfather of modern-day neoconservatism is considered to be Irving Kristol, father of Bill Kristol. More important than the names of people affiliated with neoconservatism are the views they adhere to. Here is a brief summary of the general understanding of what neocons believe. They agree with Trotsky on permanent revolution, violent as well as intellectual. They are for redrawing the map of the Middle East and are willing to use force to do it. They believe in preemptive war to achieve desired ends. They accept the notion that the ends justify the means. They express no opposition to the welfare state. They are not bashful about an American empire. Instead, they strongly endorse it. They believe lying is necessary for the state to survive. They believe a powerful federal government is a benefit. 
They believe pertinent acts about how a society should be run should be held by the elite and withheld from those who do not have the courage to deal with it. They believe neutrality in foreign affairs is ill-advised. Force should not be limited to the defense of our country. They dislike and despise libertarians, therefore the same applies to all strict constitutionalists. They endorse attacks on civil liberties such as those found in the Patriot Act as being necessary. They unconditionally support Israel and have a close alliance with the Likud party. Various organizations and publications over the past 30 years have played a significant role in the rise to power of the neoconservatives. A product of the Bradley Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute led the neocon charge, but the real push for war came from the Project for a New American Century, another organization helped by the Bradley Foundation. This occurred in 1998 and was chaired by Weekly Standard editor Bill Kistel. They urged early on for war against Iraq, but were disappointed with the Clinton administration, which never followed through with its periodic bombings. Obviously, those bombings were motivated more by Clinton's personal and political problems than a belief in the neocon agenda. The money and views of Rupert Murdoch also played a key role in promoting the neocon views, as well as rallying support by the general population through his News Corporation, which owns Fox News Network, The New York Post, and Weekly Standard. This powerful and influential media empire did more to galvanize public support for the Iraqi invasion than one might imagine. They have been amazingly successful in their efforts to control the debate over what Western values are and by what methods they will be spread throughout the world. It's of interest to note that some large Christian denominations have joined the neoconservatives in promoting preemptive war while completely ignoring the Christian doctrine of a just war. The neocons saw and openly welcomed their support. Neoconservatism is not the philosophy of free markets and a wise foreign policy. Instead, it represents big government welfare at home and a program of using our military might to spread their version of American values throughout the world. If the neoconservatives retain control of the conservative limited government movement in Washington, the ideas once championed by the conservatives of limiting the size and scope of government will be a long forgotten dream. Anonymous has been watching. Since the inception of Occupy Oakland, we have been actively monitoring your behavior and exposing the identities and sensitive information of officers of the Oakland Police Department as they have continued to act in an unprofessional and violent manner. You tear gassed us. You shot us with your weapons. You arrested us. You beat us. You also did this to our friends and to our families. We watched as you cut budgets, cut our jobs, closed our schools, our parks, and our libraries while leaving your own salaries alone. We are shocked and disgusted by your behavior. Before you commit atrocities against innocent people again, think twice. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. You should have expected us. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit 
to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program. For from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence in the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker so decreed a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent.
it's you.